Hello, my name is Tony. Where some films are concerned, Hollywood studios self-sabotage. It's always been the case occasionally, but used to be extremely rare. Nowadays, with a pervasive and creatively fascist culture of woke dominating to the exclusion of all else, self-sabotage is increasingly the norm. Movies with massive budgets are made but aborted before release, never to see the light of day. Woke and inclusivity-driven vehicles are produced with eye-watering budgets at the expense of mass entertainment value, and bomb spectacular spectacularly at the box office. A seemingly endless cycle of self-flagellation and failure, but so invested in and dogmatically locked onto this terminally flawed and faulty ideology that it shows no sign of ending any time soon. And if the public and fans don't turn out for it and exalt it to high heaven, then they're racist, misogynistic bigots. And it's all their own fault for being such fucking dumb rednecks who need to check their Neanderthal thinking. Studios no longer respect the audience, and that's a big Big mistake, people. The future's so dark, we gotta stay home. It can't go on indefinitely because it doesn't have financial or populist legs. And as we all know, money and popularity is all in the end. And when the money runs dry and the cinemas all close, what lesson will have been learned? None. Not by the ideologues, because failure and rejection are no indicators that they weren't right and didn't do the right thing all along. This ideology cannot entertain the prospect of rejection or being wrong, no matter what the facts are, no matter what the evidence clearly confirms. You think when Adolf Hitler committed suicide in a bunker in Berlin, he thought for one instant he'd got it wrong? Fuck no. The world and the people in it, they got it wrong. They didn't sign up. It's the mantra of a hardcore fanatic. Well, good luck with that. Always works out just people. Peachy Keen. Meanwhile, Cutter's Way, a review requested by someone calling themselves Bab Gar. Won't be requesting it anymore, I'd wager, cause here it is. United Artists mishandled this film, possibly because they couldn't understand what it was they had, and therefore how to deal with and market it. They spent comparative peanuts on promotion, released it in the States under the original title of Cutter and Bone, the same title of the novel it was based on, and withdrew it from cinemas after a week. According to director Ivan Passer, the studio agreed to three audience test screenings prior to release, but allowed only one. After retitling it Cutter's Way, it was thrown onto the festival circuit, where it fared better critically, yet quickly faded from view. It re-emerged on VHS for home purchase and rental later, and that's when I first saw it. The meat and potatoes of it are thus. Richard Bone, Jeff Bridges, is a commitment-phobic gigolo in Santa Barbara. He's a casual boat salesman, but makes his real money selling sex. Leaving a hotel where he's been transactionally pleasuring a wealthy older lady, a well-preserved Nina Van Palant, his car breaks down in a side street in a rainstorm in the dead of night. A large vehicle pulls in behind him and the driver, a big man in mirrored sunglasses, dumps something in a trash can and speeds away. Bone pays the event little mind and heads off to the home of his best friend Alex Cutter, John Hurd, and his wife, Mo, Lisa Icorn. He crashes there regularly. Cutter is an irascible and mentally traumatised war vet. The war cost him an arm and a leg and an eye, and possibly his sanity. Bone and Mo are emotionally and sexually attracted to each other, but she remains committed to Cutter, self-medicated and cushioned from his behaviour by a copious alcohol intake. On the next day, garbage men discover a dead girl in the trash can. As Bone's car is abandoned in the vicinity, he's dragged in on suspicion of murder. Whilst at the station, he meets the murdered girl's sister, Valerie Ann Dusenbury, and apologises to her for being unable to provide much help to the inquiry. Later, when Bone, Cutter and Mo were at a parade, Bone sees an imposing old guy on a horse wearing mirrored shades, and immediately identifies him as the culprit. He's one J.J. Cord, Stephen Elliott, local oil baron and mega-rich capitalist patriarch of political influence. Even though Bone can't be sure Cord is the perp, this is all Cutter needs to propel him on a quest to strike back at a system and social hierarchy he hates and holds responsible for his life situation. He ropes Valerie into his cause and the two persuade Bone to assist in blackmailing Cord for money, the reasoning being that if the man agrees to pay, this will be tantamount to an admission of guilt and they can turn him over to the police. From then on in, events play out as a neo-noirish combination of tragedy, death and a climactic endgame with blunt full-stop finale. Cutter's Way is a caustic and incisive autopsy on the corpse of 60s counterculture and a critique of a flourishing social hierarchy that favours impunity for the rich and powerful whilst the poor are just grist for the mill, crushed, abused, trampled underfoot and discarded like the disposable nothings they are.
It's a deeply fascinating piece of work on several levels and in several ways. Initially, what strikes most is the performances by the core trio, Heard, Bridges and Icorn. John Heard as Cutter is completely unrecognisable and continents away from his later role as Macaulay Culkin's father in the first two Home Alone movies. He's like the bastard offspring of Tom Waits and Robert Newton's Long John Silver, with some added Easy Rider DNA shoved up his ass. He is a raging, alcoholic bully and misanthropist with a throat cancer a rasp of a voice, his affectations of poetic speech peppered with profanity and a snarling insult for every occasion and every one. Drunk, mad, delusional, abusive, his humanity only detectable in the occasional manifestations of a self-awareness that is clearly eating him up from the inside. He should be seen as a monster, but Heard is so good he manages to invoke ambiguous feelings in the viewer, some pity, understanding and empathy for someone who has lost so much for a cause that gave him only a prosthetic leg and eye patch and a grim life on the fringes in return. Talking of ambiguity, there's a lot of it in Cutter's way, but we'll get to that. Then there's Jeff Bridges' Bone, a handsome, charming sex toy with no direction or purpose in life. Alex and Mo are his best friends, and he seems to spend his time split between living at their place or on a boat at the dock, where he works, but not very enthusiastically, selling boats to people who can afford them. Like Richard Gere's Julian in American Gigolo, he's a sex hustler catering for the needs of older rich women, but lacks that character as drive, ambition or backbone. Bridges reaffirmed just why he was one of the best screen actors of his generation, as a charismatic charmer who only aspires to casually drift and coast through life. Last thing he wants is to be part of a murder investigation or to join a crusade. Of the three, Lisa Icorn's Mo is the most sympathetic, the bruised feminine apex of a weird love-hate triangle. She drinks heavily, cares about and for Cutter, who treats her appallingly, and she clearly has sexual and emotional feelings for Bone. She tries to be the voice of reason, but any reasonable sound she makes falls on dismissive and deaf ears. Again, performance-wise, she's hard to fault. Icorn projects a crushed, vulnerable and damaged soul, with a sense of aching and longing for some better life that doesn't seem attainable any time soon. Cutter's way didn't resonate favourably with most critics, and the public showed it minimal interest. I believe it's a lot to do with how it goes out of its way to be ambiguous and doesn't like to share information freely. If at all in most circumstances, it raises questions readily enough but has no intention whatsoever of answering them. Was the expectation that the audience wouldn't ask in the first place, just accept what is seen and heard, or fill in the blanks themselves? I can only guess because to my knowledge no one involved in the film has ever elucidated. Almost everything has remained unanswered. So here's what you won't be told and won't ever know, and as an example of where we're at, to give you some idea of the approach, even the Vietnam War is never mentioned by name, just vaguely referred to as the war. We glean that Cutter is a war vet, but what war is never clearly established. We can assume, and it makes sense time-wise, that it's Vietnam. But this is an example of how information-shy and narratively tight-lipped Cutter's way really is. See how it works? How Cutter and Bone are best friends, we don't know. There is no backstory or history provided. They're not two people you'd immediately put together as best buds. Is Cutter's blackmail plan on the level? Valerie thinks it is, but both Bone and Moe have serious doubts, thinking that if he's successful in extorting money from Cord, he plans to keep it. When Cutter's house burns down, incinerated Moe to death, is Cord responsible? Cutter sent him a threatening blackmail note just before this happens, but we are not privy to the truth. So was it an accident, coincidence, suicide, what? Speculation is all we're left with. In this film, you either don't know anything at all, or you don't know anything for sure. And not everyone is comfortable with that. Me, I don't mind it much. Apart from the fact that Valerie disappears from the narrative just prior to Cutter's house burning down, and is never seen or heard from again. Now you see her, now you you don't. The film burns some significant time, setting her up as a prime mover in Cutter's blackmail plan, establishing a relationship with Cutter and Bone. Consequently, wondering where the hell she went is something of a distraction. Did Cord kill her too? Did she just bail out? Did the studio cut the rest of her role for some reason? I don't fucking know, and neither will you. Cutter refers to Melville's Moby Dick early in the film, and it provides the initiative to wonder if he imagines himself as a righteous Ahab character on a crusade to do battle with a great white behemoth. Certainly, there's also a touch of the Don Quixote about his obsessive drive to tilt at a particularly impregnable windmill in the form of J.J. Cord. After Moe's death, he blames Cord, and revenge becomes more his motivation than seeing justice done for a murdered girl or to tear down the hierarchy. When he and Bone infiltrate 
celebrate a garden party in the grounds of Cord's stately home, Bone is caught by security and taken before Cord. Chased by heavies, Cutter rides a horse out of the stables, leaving mayhem in his wake as he gallops through the ground scattering guests and buffet trestles. A disabled and gnarled white knight on a white charger chasing down a dragon. Thrown by the horse through the window of Cord's drawing room, he is seemingly killed. Bone rushes to his side and takes his automatic pistol. He places it in Cutter's dead hand and aims it at Cord. Two men, two fingers on the same trigger. Finally, Bone has found enough grit and vertebrae to commit to something, to take a stand. It was you. He accuses Cord. What if it were? Cord replies with a chilling confidence of the monstrously entitled. In a display of consummate sneering arrogance, he puts on his mirrored shades. Simultaneously, the screen goes black and there is a booming gunshot. The film ends. We don't see the outcome. We are left to construct it in our mind's eye. Just to be clear, I don't mind the lack of exposition, the ambiguity, the absence of character backstory and history, or filling in the blanks for myself, or indeed the ending. In my reading, it's simple. Cord is an evil monster who murdered a girl, dumped her like so much garbage in a trash can, and Cutter is right about him. He is so rich and powerful, he feels he is above the law and can sidestep all consequences. Whether Cutter wants the money or justice from the blackmail scheme or both, I'm indecisive about, but judging by his hatred of the system, I lean a little more towards the justice angle. In the end, Cutter dies and Bone executes Cord. That's how I see it. Anyone else is at liberty to explain it differently. Judge from what I've experienced of his work, this is the best thing director Ivan Passer ever did. The score by Jack Nietzsche is wonderfully haunting and hypnotic. Jordan Cronenweth's cinematography is dazzling and crisp, making good use of the sunsplash Santa Barbara locations, infusing the daylight scenes with a glossy and plush veneer of colourful menace and unease. Cronenweth went on to do stellar lens work on Blade Runner. Screenplay by Jeffrey Allen Fiskin, who these days is a writer and producer for the detective series Bosch, has a lot of smart lyrical dialogue that manages to be clever in an uncontrived way. The construction of the narrative is fine, but it does slow to a crawl when Bone and Moe get together for the lead-up to the inevitable bedroom scene. This drags a bit. The main purpose is to illustrate further Bone's inability to commit, to even spend in the night with someone he genuinely cares for. He creeps out of bed and leaves the house. Next day, it is burnt down and Moe is dead. Before summing up, I'm going to mention once again that dropping a character from the narrative for no explicable reason was a serious misstep. It derails things. Sometimes a bit of clarity is needed now and then. Okie dokie, here we go. Counterculture died at Altamont in 1969. The flower power love and peace movement died with it. The Stones weren't to blame for the event, but the organisers of the concert must bear some responsibility. Who and in what universe ever thought getting the Hells Angels to run security for a massive free concert was a good idea? Nothing breeds disillusionment more effectively than senseless violent death, except maybe war, so we can indict Vietnam as an accessory before, during and after the fact. A decade on from then, Cutter, Bone and Moe are the unwitting surviving casualties of counterculture, dwellers on the fringes of a society when it's no longer cool, hopeful and with it to be so. They're variously damaged, drunk, full of impotent rage, despair, regret, burnt out and facing a future with no plan or direction to take them there. Even though it was made in 1980, someone, I can't remember who, but someone called it the last great Hollywood movie of the 60s and that's something I would agree with. Despite the time difference, which of course I'm fucking aware of. I'm not an idiot. Well, it's a mesmerizing and compelling mood piece packed with drama and great acting. Neo Noir classifies it as good as anything, and it was a great move to cast Nina Van Palant in a cameo role in Touchstone. She co starred with Elliot Gould in Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye in 1973, perhaps the film for which the term Neo Noir was coined. Cutter's Way is flawed, certainly, but an instant cult item that remains as powerful and provocative now as ever. It deserves exposure to a wider audience immediately and watching more than once to get the most out of it. Okay, thank you if you've watched and listened. Should you have enjoyed or even if you haven't, please consider hitting like, don't like, leave a comment or perhaps subscribe to the channel if it's your sort of thing. Next up, something I wanted to do for a long time and now I have, or will to be more precise. Bet you're beside yourself with anticipation. Later, pilgrims.